So we've considered hyponatremia when blood sodium or body sodium is too low and we've considered hypernatremia when it's too high. Let's now go on and think about disorders of balance of potassium. Now firstly we'll look at what happens when potassium is too low. This is referred to as hypokalemia. So low potassium is referred to as hypokalemia. Now this can occur in diarrhea and vomiting because we've said that potassium is lost through gastrointestinal secretions. It can also occur if there's long-term uh, diuretic therapy where potassium is not properly uh, replaced. It can occur in alkalosis where the blood is too alkaline and it can occur if there's increased levels of the hormone aldosterone or aldosterone. Hypokalemia, low serum potassium causes Let's think now about the effects of uh, hypokalemia. Well, interestingly, very often there are no apparent effects. It's asymptomatic. There's nothing really to notice very often, um, often asymptomatic, although there may be muscular weakness. There may be muscular weakness. But because of the disorder of the electrolyte imbalance across the cell membranes in the myocardium, then there can be atrial and ventricular ectopic beats extra heartbeats and the patient feels like they've missed a heartbeat so they can be ectopic beats and when it's more severe there can be cardiac dysrhythmias abnormalities of the heart rhythm let's think about treatment for hypokalemia what do we do about it well as, as in all the other things we've discussed we need to treat the underlying cause and restore a normal diet. So a normal diet will contain plenty of potassium, particularly in things like fruit. Bananas have got lots of potassium in them. Fruit juices, tea. And in England we chop up potatoes and fry them. We call these chips. They contain quite a lot of potassium as well. Intravenous potassium should only be given really by the direction of a, of a physician who's experienced in these matters. Very often, you would, well, normally you'd only give intravenous potassium if the, uh, there were symptoms, like they had muscle weakness or abnormal heart rhythms or something, or the serum potassium was less than 2.5 millimoles a litre. And when you replace uh, potassium, it should not be done at a rate of greater than 20 millimoles per hour, unless a senior physician says so, and even then the patient should be monitored and hourly levels of potassium should be recorded. I'm going to say something of absolutely crucial importance now. If a patient's low in potassium, or even if they're not low in potassium, never ever give them a bolus dose of potassium intravenously. If you give a patient a bolus dose of potassium, whether they're hypokalemic or whether they're normokalemic, whether the potassium is low or whether the potassium is normal, the rapid change in the level of potassium can very likely lead on to a cardiac arrest. So even though the patient's short of potassium, if you replace the potassium too quickly, you'll kill them. So never, ever, under any circumstances, give bolus doses of potassium chloride. Never ever do that. Let's emphasize that. Never give intravenous bolus potassium. Do not ever give bolus injections of potassium intravenously. You will kill your patient. Only give well mixed infusions slowly under expert medical prescription. Now the final part of this talk we're going to look at high levels of serum potassium, high levels of potassium in the blood or hyperkalemia. And this occurs for two reasons. Firstly because too much potassium is being released from the cells or secondly because of a failure to excrete potassium. The two possible causes. So, for example, failure to excrete potassium 
can occur in renal failure if the kidneys aren't working properly and not excreting the potassium. It can occur from tissue necrosis when the cells die at the death of cells after surgery or after trauma. Because remember that inside the cells there's uh, more potassium. High levels of potassium inside the cell, low levels outside. But if the cells die, the membranes lose their integrity and this potassium can leach out into the extracellular fluid from tissue necrosis, surgery or trauma. Hyperkalemia can also occur if there's uh, acidosis. Just before we go on to effects, it's interesting to know that there can actually be a physiological uh, raise in potassium after vigorous exercise, but this isn't associated with any uh, pathology at all. It's quite normal, really. So let's think about the effects then, the effects of hyperkalemia. Well, if there's hyperkalemia, there can be a hyperpolarization of cell membranes in the myocardium. That means they become too polarized. Because there's too much potassium outside the cell. Remember, potassium is a positive ion. Therefore, the cell becomes hyperpolarized. More positive on the outside than it is supposed to be. And this actually reduces cardiac excitability. So that's the main thing. So yeah, you can get muscle weakness. But it's important to notice that chain, skeletal muscle weakness. But what's so important to notice, changes in potassium may cause cardiac arrest. So high potassium is a medical emergency. Now some authorities will say it's a medical emergency if the potassium is greater than 7. Others will say it's a medical emergency if the potassium is greater than 6.5 uh, millimoles a litre. But the reason it's a medical emergency is if the potassium is very high, it can lead to an asystolic cardiac arrest. And as well as that, before that happens, you'll get progressive changes in the ECG. And what you often see is just a peaking of the T wave. So you get a P, QRS, and T in the normal situation like that. When the potassium's high, you get a P, QRS, and the T wave is often sort of uh, peaked like that. You get a peaked T wave. So if there's a peak T wave, it means the potassium is rising and there is a risk of asystolic cardiac arrest. So high levels of potassium, very dangerous to the patient. Try and address whatever's causing it, if possible. And if not, we'll go and look at a few treatment possibilities now. Now, the patient's potassium is too high if they're hyperkalemic. Basically, there's three lines of treatment we can follow. The first is we can give a calcium-based compound to protect the heart, a cardioprotective approach. The second is we can increase the amount of potassium that goes from the extracellular fluids into the intracellular fluids. So if there's more potassium inside the cells, that means there's less potassium, that's all the cells of the body. If there's more potassium inside all the cells of the body, there'll be less potassium in the blood to cause the hyperpolarization of the myocardial cells. And thirdly, we can increase the amount of potassium which is excreted from the body. Let's look at how these are done in practice. So treatment of high potassium, treatment of hyperkalemia. Doctors will sometimes prescribe 10 mils of 10% calcium gluconate. This will not remove potassium from the body, but it will reduce the harmful effects of the potassium on the myocardium, making cardiac arrest less likely. The next thing is that insulin can be given with um, some sort of sugar solution, dextrose in this case. Now, insulin gates glucose into the cells. To put it another way, insulin facilitates the transfer of glucose from the tissue fluid into the cell. But when the insulin goes into the cell, sorry, when the glucose goes into the cell, when the glucose goes into the cell, potassium goes with it. So insulin actually facilitates the transport of glucose and potassium into cells.
So if you give more insulin, you'll increase the amount of glucose and therefore the amount of potassium which goes into the cell. That's good because it lowers the amount of potassium in the blood. But obviously, if you're taking more glucose into the cells, there's going to be less glucose left in the tissue fluids uh, and in the blood. Therefore, there is a risk of an acute hypoglycemia. Giving insulin, large amounts of insulin on its own, carries the risk of life-threatening hypoglycemia. So we give insulin to increase the transport of potassium and glucose into the cells, and we give the dextrose or some other sugar preparation to prevent the hypoglycemia that the insulin will cause if it's given on its own. So insulin in this regime, 10 units, increasing the transport of glucose and potassium into the cells, therefore out of the blood, and 50 mils of 50% dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. If this is being done, keep, very close eye, keep a very close eye on the amount of sugar in the blood, the uh, serum glucose levels. Check it at least every hour, because there is a risk of acute hypoglycemia. So that can be done, but monitor the patient's blood sugar levels very carefully, and of course monitor the potassium levels very carefully. Calcium risonium, 15 grams orally up to three times per day with a laxative. The calcium risonium, when it's in the gut, attracts the potassium out of the capillaries, therefore out of the blood. And it collects in the, uh, in the gut. And if you give laxatives, you can, you can wash it out. Wash the potassium out. These are called iron exchange resins. Finally, perhaps the last resort is uh, dialysis. Hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis can remove potassium from the body. And it's important that if someone is very, does have a high potassium, that it's not dropped actually too quickly because, again, the disturbance in the balance can ab abnormally affect the myocardium. Well, that's the end of this talk on fluid and electrolyte balance and abno abnormalities in fluid and electrolyte balance. Hopefully, you've picked up a few principles that can increase your understanding of your future reading and discussing of this subject area and hopefully a few principles that you can apply to a clinical practice.